And so The Great Plains is famous worldwide and certainly in our movies for uh, uh, tornadoes. And so I'll, I'll set that, if we just look at frequency, yes, the central part of the United States, the Plains, has more tornadoes than anywhere in the world. That said, if we actually look at what impacts society, which is the footprint of the tornado, so its length times its width, um, shockingly, I think, uh, if we look historically, actually the Mid-South has more tornado footprints than the Great Plains of the United States. So if you're just looking frequency, yeah, yeah, it makes sense. But in terms of, of the effect that it has on society, um, Tornado Alley is actually the Mid-South. If we, if we really want to get down to, to the numbers. So when you, when you talk about the shifting of this, uh, it's, it's actually some research done by my colleague here at Northern Illinois University, Dr. Gensini and Harold Brooks, of course, the National Severe Storms Laboratory, who have found over the last two to three decades that there has been a shift in not only tornado frequency to the east, but also sort of a correlate to that and, and, and expected is the environment. The favorable environments for, for tornadoes have also shifted east. Some might, might say that, well, if it's reports, it's just a bias. We're, we're more people in the east now, more, more documentation. I do think that that's a part of it, but overall there is a, um, a, a, a shift in the environments eastward as well, which gives me some pause to say it's not just a bias in the reports, it's actually an environmental shift that's occurring. That as we go through the 21st century, that we're really starting to see climate changes effects, anthropogenic climate changes effects on these trends. Um, not to say that there can't be other variables like uh, more El Ninos or La Ninas or whatever it might be. Um, on this trend, but overall, I, I'm confident in saying that, that the trend that we've seen the last two to three weeks, uh, two to three um, <laughs> decades, uh, ha is going to continue into the 21st century. Yeah. And we run these these uh, these simulations at, at three and a half, three point seven five kilometers, so we can resolve things like supercells. We can even resolve the the updraft helicity, uh, the rotation within these storms, um, and so. What we do is we look at two different things. We look at the variable, the, the sort of what we call the implicit, which is the environmental changes. So how is supercell composite parameter, which is this nice little silver bullet sort of thing that mixes instability and shear. How is that changing over time? And, and guess what? We're seeing kind of a shift eastward with a decline in the Great Plains. But we can actually act, actually simulate reflectivity and updraft helicity, these variables that, that storm chasers look at all the time, right, to, to forecast to where they're going to chase. We can simulate these in, in, in these uh, in these models and we can track the supercells. And then we basically compile all those those data and we do it historically so we can kind of get some confirmation that we have confidence in our simulations. But then we also project under warming scenarios out into the 21st century. Uh, century. And this is that explicit part of the modeling. We're actually simulating the actual storms, which our global climate models do not do. And we track these and guess what? We're seeing greater populations of supercells to the east and a declining uh, supercell population in the Great Plains of the United States. Temporally, um, you know, over the order of or over the season, what we're very significant increase in sort of that February, March time frame. So one might just say earlier season start. Uh, so one, I would think that would be more outbreak days in February and March, where we're, traditionally we've had more of an April and May. Um, that's going to shift earlier. Uh, May uniquely in the historical and in the future simulations is about the same. So if you're storm chasing in the future, if you're, if you're going to make it through the 21st century, which I probably won't make it all the way through, but hopefully I'll make it a long way into the 21st century. 
um, you're still going to be able to chase in May and, and get the similar sort of ingredients. We don't see a, a major drop off in May. But once we get into June, and certainly as we get into July, the, the number of supercells rapidly declines in our future simulations. And what's happening is the desert southwest, the Mexican highlands, are heating up and drying out. That creates a very, very nice mixed layer, a hot mixed layer, hot and dry mixed layer. So while the, the mixed layer has always been hot and dry, it's getting hotter and drier. And of course, when this vex over the Great Plains with a, with, a, with a shortwave trough that's moving in or just westerly flow, that means, and you know all too well, a, a more stout capping inversion. And so when we talk about West Texas and Central Texas, Western Oklahoma, Western Kansas, New Colorado, New Mexico, you know, you're going to be dealing with a more stout cap overall, collectively wholesale. And that means suppression of storms. Unless, unless you can get a good upslope flow and get initiation off the, the you know, Sangre de Cristos or, or the, the Palmer Divide or whatever it might be, which is still going to occur, um, but you're less likely to sustain those out into the plains and, and more than likely not to get initiation out into the plains, even on a formidable dry line circulation. So um, this all logically makes sense with even the global climate models and what our projections are. It, it makes sense that we would see a decline in, in sort of isolated supercells that we all sort of are fascinated by. Yeah. Whenever we talk about climate change, a lot of a lot of folks, whether it be just temperature or you know whatever phenomena that we're talking about within the climate system, we look at the change. A lot of people just talk about the trend in the line. As is it going up? Is it going down? Is it staying flat? Actually, one of the biggest fingerprints of climate change on almost any peril is its variability. Um, you know. It, for the statistical among us, it might be the standard deviation, the variation around the mean. Um, and what we see is that pretty much across the board is that there's going to be increased variability. Um, so as you mentioned, this boomer bust that we tend to think of on an annual basis anyway, right? At least on a, on a two to three week sort of, oh, it's quiet. Oh, oh, it's active. It's what we're going to see is probably more of that. Um, so, so some more very, very quiet periods, but also on the flip side, some, some more extreme uh, uh, events when they do occur. Um, and this is not unlike some of, of the work that would be suggestive of Dr. Brooks that, that has looked at sort of this clustering of tornadoes so that when, when tornadoes do occur, they tend to be more of them and clustering of them. Um, that's, to me, kind of what we're seeing across the board with these severe weather perils, but also other perils, uh, uh, you know, heat waves, uh, cold air outbreaks, uh, whatever it might be, the increased variability um, seems to be a hallmark of, of climate change. Um, and so for storm chasers, that means that uh, you're going to have some, some more probably crappy years, uh, and certainly if you pick your, your two week vacation period uh, wrong, uh, you're gonna be sort of uh, going to look at the, uh, the, the national parks out west uh, rather than seeing any sort of condensation. Uh, but on the other years, if you know, especially if you happen to time it right, it's gonna be extremely active. And uh, I expect that sort of, of trend of, of greater variability to increase in the 21st century.